You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to WCAT Radio's Author to Author. I'm Kiki Latimer. I'm your guest host for today. And today we have with us um, from the other side of the world, from Australia, Frank Kalnidja. <laughs> oh, no, it's a weird name, but uh, never mind. It's my it's Italian. The, so that's an Italian pronunciation? Uh, it certainly is, yes. Yeah. From the very north of Italy, it comes up in, near the Swiss border. So, uh, a bit of a mixture. Well, welcome. Um, Thank you very to, much. We're here today to talk about your book, Assertions and Refutations. And um, before you tell us a little bit about yourself, why don't you begin us with a prayer? Certainly. Um, the prayer that I've chosen is a little prayer of St. Thomas that he composed and he used to say all the time before he studied and which he gave to his students also. So I'll begin with that. Eh? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Ineffable Creator, who out of the treasures of thy wisdom has appointed three hierarchies of angels and set them in admirable order, high above the heavens, and has disposed the diverse portions of the universe in such marvellous array. Thou who art called the true source of light and supereminent principle of wisdom, be pleased to cast a beam of thy radiance upon the darkness of my mind and dispel from me the double darkness of sin and ignorance in which I have been born. Thou who makes eloquent the tongues of little children, Fashion my words and pour upon my lips the grace of thy benediction. Grant me penetration to understand, capacity to retain, method and facility in study, subtlety in interpretation and abundant grace of expression. Order the beginning, direct the progress and perfect the achievement of my work. Thou who art true God and man and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. It's actually one of my favorite prayers. Um, I haven't heard that um, translation of it, but that was beautiful. Um, that, yeah, I know. It's a wonderful prayer. That prayer became rather well known when Pope Pius XI put it right at the end of his encyclical, encyclical on studying St. Thomas, which is called Studiorum Ducem. It was written in 1923. And that, that uh, little prayer which is basically probably not very well known except outside of the Dominican order, I would think, but uh, became rather well known when when he put it in that encyclical. It is a beautiful little prayer. It's such a... It's it such covers a, everything, yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it should, does. Should. Yeah, yeah. My husband and I have um, led a Summa Theologica wrestling group, we call it, um, oh, the Summa God. group for the last 25 years, and right. uh, we begin with a version of that prayer. Of that prayer, yeah. 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 And, oh, well, there you go. Uh, yeah. And one of my favorite moments when I was teaching my Vietnamese students, I, I used that prayer one night to mm-hmm. begin class, um, and they asked me if I had written it. <laughs> 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 so yeah. I told them, of course I wrote it. <laughs> and I you know, gave credit to Thomas. But oh, yes. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself to start off with. Sure. Well, I'm a retired electrical engineer. I worked for most of my professional life in the sphere of power generation, which is a fairly specialist type of area um, in uh, power generation, for, mostly from steam power generation, gas turbines, that sort of thing. That probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But um, I've long had um, an interest in philosophy and theology um, going back a number of years, I suppose, to a point of um, when I had a bit of a conversion in my life. I started to become much more interested in my faith. And um, through um, some friendships I made, um, I started to become interested in the philosophy of St. Thomas, and this was given, I guess, a lot of impetus when I started to read papal encyclicals, which are a wonderful source of information for um, guiding your studies and learning the truth about reality, about morals, about the church, about the papacy, about the Bible, about everything. Um, The Pope is really the supreme teacher 
of the human race. Um, so to pick up papal encyclicals that were specially devoted to the study of St. Thomas, um, the first one being the attorney patris of Pope Leo XIII, written in 1879. Um, and once I'd started reading these encyclicals, I then became more interested in trying to study St. Thomas from a philosophical perspective um, in a bit more detail and in, in, in a greater depth. Um, to do that, it's um, not something you can find these days in university courses, um, as you will well understand. Um, mm -hmm. St. Thomas has been banished to the... Um, to the moon, you might say, in uh, most secular institutions and also in a lot of Catholic institutions, unfortunately. This is a very mm. sad fact. And that goes very much against the insistence of the popes down through the time of um, Leo XIII, who insisted that uh, St Thomas should be made the um, principal source of teaching in Catholic uh, education. That has been largely ignored. Um, but anyway... So to circumvent this um, obstacle, I started um, reading books on St Thomas by some very good authors, those who were recommended, um, people like Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, who I have great admiration for, Jacques Maritain, um, Dr Austin Woodby, who was an Australian Thomas. He was actually taught by Garrigou Lagrange in Rome, and he started the Aquinas Academy in Sydney in the shortly after the Second World War, um, and he wrote a lot of texts um, in a systematic form, <clears throat> studying the different areas of philosophy. They're very comprehensive, and I got interested in these texts through um, friendships I've made with people in the eastern states, um, on the other side of the country, that is, for people in America. You have an eastern side and a western side, so, so do we. I'm in the western portion of the country, which is probably your California or something like that. So, okay. <laughs> um, uh, but I started to get interested in these, and um, um, we can, you know, I picked up um, knowledge basically through um, studying different uh, authors: G.K. Chesterton, Joseph Pieper, Piper, or however you like to pronounce it. Um, all the very best, Thomas. You know who. People who've studied St Thomas in depth and who have a good grasp of what he's about, um, mm. that's a bit difficult for a novice um, to go and pick up the Summa Theologia, open the first couple of pages and <laughs> you read St Thomas's <coughs> book for beginners. Oh, mm. it's not quite like what St Thomas actually meant by that as a beginner. Yeah. As someone who's actually done the three yeah. years of philosophy needed for studying theology, that's what he calls a beginner. So someone who's just starting out, studying philosophy, they're a little bit further behind than, um, you know, what uh, what one might otherwise expect. But certainly studying systematically, reading St Thomas's work, the, some <coughs> of the Tiles, um, some of his commentaries on Aristotle, for example. Um, reading Aristotle can be difficult because... Um, once again, you need the guide of someone like St. Thomas who made commentaries on various of Aristotle's mm. works, the more important and significant. <clears throat> really well, there's talk. a lot of him in the Summa for sure. Oh, yeah. uh, when we started studying the Summa 25 years ago, um, first of all, we thought it would take us two or three years meeting once a mm. month, and it took us 25 mm. years. Yeah, we well, just the, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> Even the great masters who write commentaries on it, um, yeah. it's almost uh, a grand work even for them, you know. So, <clears throat> and um, we really didn't know what we were doing when we started. It was very difficult. Yeah. <clears throat> it was like learning a new language. Yeah, sure. Um, sure. But we were lucky. We had some professors who joined us, mm -hmm. um, some of whom were, you know, Thomistic um, really yeah. experts, so they helped us yeah. get started yeah. the first year or two. Um, yeah, you have to know various for twenty-five know, years. <laughs> sure, you have to know various <laughs> philosophical terms or various substance, accident, matter, form, essence, of existence. Um, Everything is there. Fact and Everything. potency. All these things are philosophical concepts, and they use extensively in um, 
theology. So if you don't have a knowledge of these things to start off with, a lot of the theology you read might become a little bit dry and doesn't make the sense that it should have and you become uh, disoriented, not disoriented, <laughs> but you become put off by it because you're not making progress. So yeah. uh, that's why philosophical training is so necessary at the beginning of studying theology and philosophical training too. St Thomas says it's an order that that should be done in um, yeah. Metaphysics, well, it's certainly the foundation. Yeah. yeah, metaphysics, for example, is the highest of the <laughs> philosophical studies, um, according to St. Thomas and Aristotle. That's the most noble. The most important to us, however, on this earth is ethics. Uh, but to study natural philosophy, ethics, um, metaphysics, you need... It's like, um, I would say, <laughs> a carpenter needs work, needs tools to do something. He needs to sharpen his... Just sizzles and chisels and saws, and so he needs to have the right, to, you know, to work on wood or whatever he wants to make. It's the same <coughs> philosophy, and the, and the instrument that the philosophers use is logic. Um, that should be the first study or the first subject study, and it's one of the more abstract and difficult s- subjects to study. But mm-hmm. but anyway, so <coughs> yeah, that's, um, and that's been kind of thrown out in a lot of the universities. Uh, yeah, well, logic these days tends yeah. to be um, very much just mathematical logic, which I am very familiar with in my um, career as an engineer doing controls, control problems, you know, electrical circuit yeah. controls and things like this. So it's very much used there. It's the logic of a computer, effectively, um, whereas um, metaphysical logic or the logic of Aristotle is a different thing altogether. And this um, modern logic, if you like to say, certainly Aristotle was very familiar with and only forms a very special part of um, of logic. It's more to do with empiricism with matter. And only looks at um, things from a material perspective. It doesn't penetrate, it doesn't, it's not based on the reality of things, the logic of the universal metaphysical logical, which is, is what Aristotle's <coughs> logic is. So... Um, Finding a true, fortunately, um, Dr. Woodby wrote a very good text on logic, the very um, the very first one in his series of uh, texts to study. So I've been through that a few times. Not that I know it all, but um, I've got some in, in the, some appreciation of what it's about. So and that helps you understand um, other areas of philosophy, not only as a tool to proceed in a logical manner, but um, what some of the uh, terms and the concepts are so that when you come to read texts in, say, metaphysics or ethics, you've already got some appreciation of what um, what terminology means. So mm-hmm. anyway, so it was basically through my own self-motivation, really, and reading and discussing with... Uh, that's a very good way to increase in knowledge. I've had a couple of very um, good friends, um, one who's now deceased, um, the other one's still living. They were both living in the eastern states, one still is, but um, I've learned a lot from discussions with them, reading things that they've written. Um, So one never stops learning if one applies oneself, so even at my age. So there's hope for everybody. If I can do it, then then um, it should be encouragement for everybody to do it, to do it really. well, people who are interested in it. So, And it's very important because not only um, is it a, a preparation to study theology, um, for example, in logic, you learn to pick up um, sophistry and arguments, falsehoods and things like that, um, bad argumentation, when people are drawing conclusions from principles or from things that look like principles but in fact not, uh, the equivocations or some other form of logical fallacy and these sorts of things you can learn up, learn as well from just studying logic and philosophy. So, um, yeah, so you had of... all of that background when you read something by Tracy Rowland. <laughs> Certainly, that's correct, yeah. Um, now I came interested in her work. I'd never really heard much about her, I didn't know much about her, but... Um, Can you tell us, explain to our listeners here who she is? 
Certainly, and, I, can, um, I can. First of all, I can and tell what you what prompted the writing of your yes, book. Certainly, certainly. Um, um, what first prompted my interest in her was a short commentary sent to me by one of the friends who I've uh, been talking about, whose name is Dr. Donald Boland, who's had uh, some books published um, on En Route, uh, very good books, actually. Um, he sent me a short commentary that are written about certain uh, statements that uh, Dr. Rollman had made in her book, Rats in His Faith, The Theology of Benedict XVI, comments that she'd made about um, the Leonine revival of Thomism, the, the one that I was talking about that was instigated by Attorney Partridge's encyclical, and about Neo Thomas, and one in particular, Father Reverend Garrett, Reginald Garrett de Lagrange, and she treated, treated them in rather a gratuitous manner, making comments about Thomism and Garrigou Lagrange in particular, pointing out alleged intellectual defects and so forth. So I thought this is not right because I've read um, what, uh, you know, these authors. Uh, so that sort of got me interested in their work. So I went and just um, did a bit of a search on the internet to find out what else, uh, what other books she's got available, what other articles, and I found another one with Neo Thomism in the title, and that was the one that I finished up um, writing my book about, and um, that was available freely on the internet. It was a journal article published in Communio some years ago, on which I believe Dr. Rowland was on the editorial board. She may still well be, I don't know. But anyway, um, that's what prompted my interest for a start. Dr. Rowland is, um, from what I know of her, she's an academic theologian. Uh, I think these days she's um, working mainly um, on the staff of the University of Notre Dame, or Notre Dame, as uh, you might call it, in Sydney. Um, she's was appointed a few years back to the International Theological Commission for a period of five years. I think that might be over now. Um, she's written a number of books on, on Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, too, in fact, um, and the one that I just mentioned. And she's held up, uh, well, she's acclaimed um, in, in high ecclesiastical circles and in academic circles, both here in Australia and internationally, even in the Vatican, as being an expert on the theology, the thinking of Pope Benedict XVI stroke Cardinal Ratzinger. So anyway, um, when I read this um, article that she'd written, uh, Natural Law from Neo-Thomism to Nuptial Mysticism, what a, that funny word is, that funny terminology. She doesn't really define what that is anywhere in the article. But anyway, when I started reading this, I thought to myself, um, well, she's contradicting the first thing that um, Pope Leo XIII said about um, the natural law in his encyclical Attorney Patris, that it's simply a, a reason telling us to do what is good and avoid sin. That's the basic, the most general universal principle which applies everywhere and all the more particular principles and propositions, practical propositions of the practical intellect in, in the natural law. So when I saw this and what you were saying and from my own knowledge of the natural law, which I must, might say was um, fairly minimal at that time because I hadn't really started researching on that particular subject, I said, well, this is wrong. So I went through... Uh, her um, article, which is not a very long article, and um, effectively she's saying that uh, human reason is unable to discover the natural law, it doesn't know the natural law, it's ignorant of the natural law, and it needs, um, in order to know the natural law, we need divine revelation and the virtue of faith received in baptism. Um, and this coming from a woman who is supposed to be a theologian of high academic standard um, was rather astonishing to me how so many people, including bishops and 
prelates have, um, who have acclaimed her work, apparently. We have not picked up this particular aspect of her work. Um, and there's further problems with that because there's a confusion of faith and reason. What's the domain of each in her work? They're distinct, but they're united in the human intellect because um, faith is in the reason. So anyway, I found this um, <clears throat> article rather repetitive. She's effectively kept repeating the same thing by getting different authors to say the same words um, that she'd read. So it was effectively a, it was a bit like watching um, a parade of public opinion, you know, or Catholic public opinion of theologians, you might say, mm. um, if that makes sense. Um, mm. uh, there wasn't any substance in it. It was just a list of assertions. So I decided, well, um, I should write something about this. So then I started to compile... Um, I thought the best way to do this was to show that she was contradicting papal teaching uh, and use that at the same time to give people an idea by quoting from papal teaching what the natural or moral law actually is, how it works. And um, so that's what prompted the, uh, the, the writing of the book in the first place. So. Well, I found it interesting because it's... it's um... <clears throat> it's always been apparent to me that even very small children understand natural law long before they have any kind of faith. I mean, the favorite thing a four-year-old child says is, that's not fair. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you take his toy or you say you have to go to bed early and they say, that's not fair. Um, and so they already have a concept of justice. Yes, they know the no difference between, in fact, um, our first knowledge, um, and and Chesterton puts this in a marvelous manner. In his, I quoted from it in the um, in the book. Um, the first apprehension of a child is that knows that something exists, and immediately knowing that he knows it's false to say that it doesn't exist. So the concept of truth already comes into the in intellect even when we're infants, and that's how we learn these things. And associated with that. Um, is a concept of good because good and evil or privation is simply the principle of non-contradiction under the aspect of good and both truth and goodness are transcendental modes of being which is probably a, it's a technical term but um, it effectively means once we grasp being we grasp the truth of being and we, we apprehend being even the being of our own, our own existence as something good, um, you know, and this is what we're inclined to follow with the natural mind. <clears throat> right, and we have all of that long, usually long before we have faith. Um, correct, yeah. Correct. Concept correct. of divine law. Um, yeah. If we didn't have it, we simply wouldn't be able to function as human beings, you know. Right. That would be like, uh, I mean, God governs creation according to the, the created natures that he's given us. And um, that's that's true with everything in creation. Whatever nature something has, whether it's a, a brute animal, a human being, an angel, or a tree, or a rock, um, he governs creation according to the particular created nation, nature or essence that that, that individual thing is. So, um, And in the human, that's a rational nature. And it means that our will is involved also with um, the natural law, it means it directs us toward what we know is to be good. So, right. <clears throat> and so she says that natural law comes, is secondary, right? I mean, that you need divine, you need to know God and divine law first mm. before you can know that murder mm. is wrong. <laughs> Well, in even divine law, um, when we talk about law, um, divine law now, um, the plan by which God governs all of creation is called the eternal law. Uh, the plan by which he governs human beings is a direct derivation of that, and, that, and that's the natural moral law. There's also divine positive law, which is the old law, the law in the 
Old Testament, like the Ten Commandments, and there's um, the New Law, which is the law or the grace of the Holy Spirit, um, which we receive at baptism and which is um, activated in us by the teaching of the church, hearing the truth of the gospel, the catechism, and so forth. Um, so, so do you feel that Rowland just combines both of the all of these things into no, one? I don't. No, she really has no time for the natural moral law at all, as far as I can see from from what she writes. Um, uh, everything is a theological. She wants to put a theological form on, on just about everything, as far as I can see, which is very weird. Um, it certainly, is. Uh, it's, you know. Um, so so would uh, she say that the moral law just can't be known by someone effectively that's what she's saying in her in her um in an article that i've criticized and um to point this out just how opposed this is to um catholic teaching um i've gone through the method i've used um to talk about her in the book is i've taken her article um and written it out sentence by sentence, and under after each sentence I've made a comment. I've either opposed, put it in relief by opposing papal teaching or the teaching of St Thomas or the teaching of some of the great Thomas of the 20th century um, against her statements to show just how incongruous and how out of touch with the reality they are. Um, and, you know... I think if um, her erstwhile um, fans happen to read my book, I think they're going to be rather shocked by what they find out. So, because yeah. mm-hmm. no one seems to have made, not that I can find anyway, um, some sort of a serious study of what she's actually done. Um, so that was the method of the book, just a sentence by sentence reproduction of her article. Not all sentences were reproduced. Um, um, but I soon realised once I started doing that, and it took me quite, pardon me, quite some time. I had to do a lot of reading um, of papal encyclicals, the work of St Thomas, um, Thomas, to find um, suitable material to include. But the more I got into it, the more the more satisfying it became because it was rather educational for me as well. So. Um, yeah. You know, um, so I was learning as I was going, really, and uh, that's always part of the self-education process, you know. So I think uh, and then by comparing her statements with, say, the one particularly, um, um, the teaching of Pope Benedict XVI on uh, the natural moral law, he's written a number of four or six addresses. I can't remember the exact number now which I've quoted from some quite extensively in the book, just to show how what um, the assertions made in Dr. Rowland's article are completely contrary to what um, Pope Benedict XVI said about the natural moral law. So, um, uh, and that's not just um, a claim that I'm making. It's a simple, a simple fact of just comparing what she says against what the Pope says and against what St. Thomas says. Um, so now you, you mentioned, you talk about the fact that the natural law has always been the foundation for any conversations between believers and non-believers. Certainly within the minds of the church. Uh, Benedict XVI is very strong in pointing this out. Um, not only him, but Pope before him, um, John the 23rd, Pius the 12th, um, they all use the natural moral law. In other words, because the natural moral law, it's inscribed in our nature. Everybody, every human being has human nature. They have the fact that they have the capacity to reason. Um, and they have the capacity, and they have a free will. Um, they have the same faculties as a Catholic. Um, certainly, the light of faith 
strengthens us and add, brings an added light, but it doesn't remove or blot out the natural law that's already there. And the Pope's, um, Pope, Pope Benedict, Benedict said, um, the church has always pointed to nature and reason as the true sources of law and has never relied upon um, divine revelation for discussions of um, morals in the public square. And he makes that point quite clearly in one of his addresses, and I quote that um, mm. in the book to sort of set off the um, comparison with um, what Tracy Rowland is saying, because she's saying the exact opposite. The church shouldn't do that. It's been a failure. You know, look at all the evil in the world. People can't understand the moral law. So um, it's it's weird, you know. Um, but mm. there you go. One can yeah. only deal with people's statements and what they say according to the normal meaning of the words that they've used in their statements. Um, one can't be a mind reader, but um, according to what she's written, um, the way that people would normally understand what she's written, and it's quite straightforward. Um, you need supernatural theology. You need the gift of faith in order to understand that murder is wrong, for example. Um, right. Telling lies is wrong. Um, for example, we all have a natural inclination to know the truth. Now, even habitual liars don't like to be lied to. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> like St. Augustine said, I've met many who've wanted to, to deceive, but no one who wanted to be deceived. So there's something within human nature that tells us being lied to is an evil. And that yeah. comes, that's the first principle of the natural moral law. Um, so... It's it's very easy to, for example, one of the principles of the natural moral law that um, that comes about from this metaphysical analysis that St Thomas gave is human beings have a natural inclination to subdue the earth and acquire the material goods that are that are necessary to live and for our well being. Um, what opposes that is Theft opposes that, it thwarts that natural inclination. And, if, and of course, this is, it's written in, one, in the Decalogue as the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. And in this way, um, all the principles of the, mat, of the natural moral law can be related to um, the Ten Commandments. Um, so um, that's, that's um, you know, a thief, as I say, someone who steals doesn't want to be stolen from. They don't want to have their money stolen or, you know, yeah. cheated out of um, what's rightfully there. So they know this principle themselves, except they don't live by it. So it's, it's, it's a fallacy to say that because there's so much evil in the world, people don't know the, the natural moral law. They might have, they, a lot of people might have deadened the voices of conscience by, by continual sin, you know, continually doing a certain thing or living in a certain way or mm. deadened the voice of their conscience. So the vice has become entrenched and they keep doing this, whatever it is they do, you know. So, uh. Well, it's been one of the problems here in the United States with the Roe v. Wade decision on abortion, mm -hmm. um, where there's been a continuous, you know, outcry, you know, a, a claim that the abortion issue is a religious issue. Mm, no, no, and not it's a, not a religious issue any more than rape or murder or stealing or lying. It's a moral issue. The same, um, with, but, um, the same with so-called homosexual marriage. That's not a religious right, issue. It's a moral right, issue. Not a really, it's a moral issue. They've been very clever. They call it homophobia. Right. Yeah, uh, they're phobia. very clever. Yeah. Now, homophobia is an irrational fear of something like we wouldn't pillory someone or put them up for public ridicule for being a claustrophobic, for example, um, they need some sort of a treatment. But this homophobia, so-called, is just um, really an excuse to deflect um, yeah. the argument just to avoid uh, criticism. But yes, you're right. In the other side is very clever. It's been it's oh. been wonderful. I don't know if you've had a chance to read any of the Dobbs decision, but. You know, everyone's yelling that, you know, this is this religious decision has been made. And yet you look no, at the decision no. and there's nothing about religion in it. No, it's no. pure no. natural law. That's right. Well, you know, from A to Z. Exactly. 
Exactly. You know, if these same people, for example, um, if someone stole their property or swindled them out of their house or something like that, um, they wouldn't be saying, oh, you can do that because um, I can't criticise you because to criticise you and take you to court, I'd be, I'd be having recourse to the religious principle of thou shalt not steal, you know? Right. You, yeah. you see what I mean? How, yeah. How, oh, how yeah. And how upside down all this. Um, and that's why the world, modern world badly needs St Thomas um, because in education in St Thomas um, dispels a lot of these things. Um, mm. Of course, the assistance of grace, the, the help of God is needed, of course, grace, uh, because we human beings can't do very much without the continual help of God because of our fallen yeah. human nature and our, yeah. and our inclination towards towards sin. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, but, yeah, you're exactly right. Roe versus Wade and the huge protests, well, I don't know about huge protests, but they get a lot of uh, traction, certainly in the mass media. Um, I think a lot of people would be glad that this um, has been been overturned. A lot of decent people... To understand that even if they're not religious, they know that um, to kill a child is murder and they know it's an evil thing. So, um, you know. So, right. You don't, shouldn't need to be religious to know the basics. No. I think the confusion comes in at times because the natural law is written in the Old Testament mm, that is as the Ten yeah. Commandments that, you know, that gives some people maybe this um tracy the idea that um somehow the two are meshed together and you know which i guess on the order of being is they are but certainly not in the order of knowledge um and i I, part of me wondered is that her confusion uh it's really difficult to know i think it's a confusion possibly between uh faith and reason now um that's a dogma of the church declared by the First Vatican Council that uh, human reason can prove the existence of God. Um, but the proof is not easy to do. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people wouldn't actually be able to give themselves or find them philosophical certitude. They come to, I think everybody comes to the realization fairly early in life that God exists, mostly through the voice of conscience when they're, when they're going to do something that their reason or the, that, you know, tells them that there's, tells them that it's wrong. Um, but because, um, these proofs, for example, the five proofs of St. Thomas for the existence of God, because they're not easy, um, and because we're prone to make errors, um, they reveal that there's, the God is, there's one God is, um, part of divine revelation. It's been so that we can know with certitude, you know, and it's the same with, uh, the negative precepts or the precepts that we read in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. They're, they're made known to us because, um, we are in a state of, we have a fallen human nature and we're naturally, we're inclined to go more towards disordered passions, um, you know, we disorder in the will, you know, follow, see good in the wrong things. We yeah. still follow the principle of do, do good and follow and avoid evil. It's just that sometimes we think that things which are not good are actually good and we still go for them, you know. So, and that's where sin comes in because we've got false ideas about these, about the wrong opinions. So, um, that's why, um, it's only, it's a positive law, um, made so that everybody can know without confusion. Um, but that doesn't, um, cancel out the fact that, um, the natural moral law is known from a human nature. Um, you talk about the, I've got here, the natural law is the right basis for dialoguing with the secular world. Mm-hmm. So it's our, our foundation. You used it. What was that lingua? What did you call it? Oh, that's not my term. Lingua franca? 
lingua mm. franca, a French tongue, mm. yeah, French language. Um, that's something uh, Roland uses, or I think rather misuses. In uh, she talks in metaphors a lot rather than uh, in plain English, but um, um, that's a common. And we all have different languages. I mean, we speak English. Um, other people don't speak English. Um, there's all concepts are not words. Words are only um, signs of concepts, audible signs. I mean, the secret. If 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 concepts were just some words, and words meant. Um, There'd be no such thing as language translation, for example. The key is the key is to find um, a common conceptual basis um, for um, the different words that mean the same thing in different languages. Um, but the natural law is the right basis for, um, according certainly to the church, um, to Saint Thomas in his own the example of his own life when arguing. Um, or disputing with others. He never argued like in a fight, but in uh, he'd always speak on the reasons and the statements of the philosophers. He wouldn't appeal to um, those who were not baptised um, on the principles of faith. Um, and the church is the same. Um, and it's telling us um, Christians should understand the natural moral law Um should make a study of it in order to participate, not only for their own benefit, in order to be able to um, participate in all areas of modern living, you know, whether it's government, legislation, um, education, philosophy, science, medical ethics, um, medical treatment. Um, it's as wide as... Um, our, our activities and our society is wide because that's the basic principle that governs all our actions. So you, say, you, really, you really can't have a society, any kind of civilization, without the moral law. That's correct, yeah. Nothing, you know, otherwise I just have to sort of stay in my cave because you might kill me or steal from me. Um, so mm. I certainly can't have any kind of culture um, if I can't, if there isn't some level of trust and understanding, which is the moral law. If you mean moral actually, culture, yeah. Um, it depends what you mean by culture, I think. Um, um, I wouldn't say, for example, you can't have, we might, high culture, we might say listening to poetry and classical music as, as cultural things. Uh, right. But it's quite interesting that... Um, during the during the Nazi regime in Germany, um, in the early last century, um, Germany was still considered to be rather a cultured nation because of their love of um, classical music and all this sort of thing, you know. But when you look, but at they the had the moral law for themselves, like you were saying, they didn't want to be killed or stolen from or lied yeah, to. Right. Or but, they, but but they had eugenics on a wide scale. They had all sorts of um, evil going on, you know, uh, the evils that are resurfacing today in much of uh, so-called Western civilization, the post-Christian civilization, um, you know, it's lost its Christian roots, but the human beings that populate it still have the natural moral law. So it's still, there's still a basis for, you know, redeeming society and individuals within it. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I didn't realize myself, to what an extent the church does um, emphasise the natural moral law using nature and reason in communicating with people outside the church, you know, um, outside in different cultures. They can be from different cultures, different backgrounds. I mean, we could go into Africa, into the jungle, and you would find the moral law there is even evident, among, you know, amongst isolated people, you know, who've lived in a sort of a tribal Tribal. I mean, they might have uh, practices that are that are in need of correction, but they will basically have a family structure, um, you know, um, respect for life to a certain extent. You know, um, right. there's, 
You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there have been philosophers that have argued that if, for instance, if God does not exist, anything is permissible. I mean, well, that's God kind of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I prove that God doesn't exist? <laughs> that's a difficult thing to prove. Right? <laughs> yeah, prove it's it's, it's, it's impossible to prove. It's yeah. impossible to, to prove a prove negative. Yeah. True, you know? that, yeah. that something that's false is true. It's impossible. If God didn't exist, there'd be nothing. And what's nothing? Nothing is just a right. privation or absence of being, you know. it's uh, We only know it through a negative concept. We have no positive grasp of it because there's nothing to grasp. Excuse the, you know, the punch. Right. So. Prove, prove that you didn't rob the bank. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Yeah, that's the way. Prove, prove yourself mm-hmm. innocent. That, otherwise, you assume guilty. You know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, how much yeah. of that is reappearing in modern uh, legal systems um, and so forth? You know. So, did you feel that her this confusion that she has in in um, it, it's just not noticed by? I mean, she's I a theologian. Know. I have no idea, really. I can't. Um, I can't speak for what other people. I don't know what other people have um, read or how. What, what they they probably a lot of these people who think she's uh, um, who I speak of are very probably know her. I don't know. Um, I can't make a comment on what other people think, or I wouldn't even try. Um, all I can comment is on what she's written. Um, and compare that to reality. Uh, why other people haven't seen this is um, is a little bit uh, strange. But um, my book has actually been sent around to some people um, in academic institutions in the eastern states, um, you know, pointing this out to them. So uh, yeah. it'll be interesting to see what sort of response, if any, comes from these people. Um, so you so. haven't received a response? No. Yeah. But you know that's um, that's down to the people who have something put before them. Um, they can do. It's their free will whether they read it or whether they chuck it in the rubbish bin or whether they choose to ignore it or whether they um, respond to it. Uh, but normally, when you send something to somebody, um, something that's serious, you at least get some form of acknowledgement. But um, that seems to be that's lacking so far. So. Uh, manners seem to be um, absent these days from, uh, you know, if you get a letter from somebody, um, you generally acknowledge it in some form or other. It uh, seems to be something that's disappeared from uh, from people's... Uh, so she brain. hasn't engaged you to discuss it? Oh, no, no, I didn't actually send it to her. I sent it to... Um, uh, I think uh, it was sent to her by directly by um, by Sebastian. So, um, oh, good. so he sent it to her, but uh, I didn't send it to her. She she probably wouldn't know who I was. So, but that doesn't. It matter. was interesting when I was reading the book. I think I had somehow skipped over the foreword or the beginning. I just sort of started reading your responses to her her but i didn't know who she was oh okay Okay. so as i was going along i thought you know you must be responding to some small person that no one's ever heard of and then at some point i don't remember it was about two-thirds of the way through the book somehow i picked up on the fact of who she was and i was so absolutely shocked that this person was you know, a mm. theologian that she was, what, the head of the family institute? Or uh, yes, that was, um, I think, that has now closed down um, mm-hmm. three or four years ago. But now I think she's um, occupies, I think it's called the John Paul II Chair of Theology at... Um, oh, my God. At, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. just awful. I, I was so shocked when I finally realized that you weren't, Refuting some minor philosopher. No, 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 no. Um, no, no. She's very highly thought of. Um, 
<laughs> in fact, you might call her the darling of um, uh, Australian academia, Catholic academia, and the darling of our prelates. Um, just that's awful. the way she. That's the way she seems to be treated to me. So, but anyway, um, you know, Very we keep on going with doing our little um, <laughs> bit, bringing forth the truth, and um, so. So you mentioned in some of the questions you sent me um, the idea of a of, uh, discussion of moral areas um, where this dialogue is really needed that you mm-hmm. see that it's really important today. Um, what areas? If framing you laws for well, look at um, well, we talked about um, right to life, euthanasia laws. They're they're evident. Um, uh, framing laws, for example. Um, now, as I said before, um, the natural law is a der- direct derivation of the eternal law, the law by which God governs all, all creation. And we have the divine positive law and the new positive law. Now, positive law is, um, if you'll find this in St. Thomas, is just um, a law that's promulgated by decree of a ruler or someone who's in charge of a community. But when it's divine positive law, it's promulgated by God who who rules all creation according to the nature that she's given each one. Now, the natural moral law, which governs human behaviour, that should be the basis of human positive laws, which is the laws that are made in legislation. If it's not, um, and then law becomes, if it's not the basis of guiding positive good laws, positive legislation from parliaments and things like that, um, those that govern society, then you find that law quickly becomes what's my, what's popular with the people or what the will of the dictator might be, like Hitler or Stalin or someone like that, you know. Um, right. It becomes the will of the individual. Now, or even the will of the people that are misguided. I mean, no. well, actually, that is um, that is the danger with fideism. Fideism is effectively the position that Rowland uh, takes on um, the natural moral law, saying that it can only be known by faith. Now, fideism is that um, doctrine which says um, we don't know God or morals by from our reason, we can only know him by faith. And that proposition was condemned by the First Vatican Council. That's quite clear. Um, she knows that. But anyway, because um, I pointed that out in the book, um, that fideism actually, if that becomes the basis of positive laws, human positive laws, then then you have all sorts of promulgations made without people understanding why they're being made, um, you know. Even though faith is what, the beginning of uh, justification with God, it, we, don't, we can't apply principles of faith, um, you know. Like, for example, in a maths class, um, we don't um, tie mathematics to talking about the Trinity or having to know the doctrine of the Trinity in order to know Euclid's yeah. theorems of geometry, for example, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so there's... Roland has a big problem as well, as I said, with secular society. She can't understand that it's just a purely natural society um, that's um, got goodness in it. If it doesn't have faith, then it's completely bad. It's almost like Luther. Luther's the same. He was the first really one who brought fideism to <laughs> prominence in the breakup of Christianity. Um, um, we know how he nailed his 95 theses to the Church of the All Saints Church in Wurttemberg. But what a lot of people may not know about St. Luther is that uh, he also um, organised a big bonfire where he could find all the books of St. Thomas's some of the Elogia and chucked them on the bonfire. So um, <laughs> like, that's the sort of mentality that you're dealing with. Um, didn't know that. Nah, yeah. Can't even imagine that, mm, you know. Mm, mm, mm. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, but 
your fideism because faith I think the problem with um, these people that follow I think Dr. Rowland to be, to be fair to her um, she's effectively following the theologians who th she thinks are right in this area and that would be Henri de Lubac uh, for example um, who had a great problem with this faith and reason, grace and nature um, mm. as, from what I can understand I won't try and talk too much in depth about that but um, uh, your faith is in the reason it's not something that I think these people think too much in concrete terms. Um, like they think it's like uh, a double decker bus, you know, when you're riding yeah. around London, for example, reason is the bottom and faith is the, the upper level, but it's not like yeah. that because faith is in the reason. It's, the, right. it's, uh, it comes from an obediential potency. In the in the intellect to be drawn to be raised by God to a higher level to see things the way God sees them to believe in the mysteries of our faith for example three persons in one God um, the second person of the Blessed Trinity becoming man without ceasing to be God um, the, the dogma of transubstantiation um, you know uh, all so these in the, things. In you talk about this concept that a lot of people, and we certainly see it here with the abortion issue, that natural law equals Catholic law. So in other words, if a Catholic says X, whatever X might be, um, then X is Catholic. You know, so if, uh, that's just, if uh, a yeah. Catholic say abortion is wrong, therefore ca abortion is a Catholic issue. No. Um, so how do we, how would you say we get out of that situation that anything a Catholic says is therefore Catholic? Mm, well, I can say that um, the sum of three angles of a triangle equal 180 degrees, but that's not a Catholic. Um, it's a Catholic triangle. <laughs> a Catholic triangle, is it? Well, it was Duke of the Catholic, you know. He was an ancient <laughs> Greek, you know. So and it's the same with philosophy, the same with morals. Um I think the way possibly to deal with this, um, like you hear this um, this slogan, I'll get your rosaries off my ovaries, you know, women. Well, for a start, an ovary is not um, an unborn child. Uh, it takes an ovary plus a component from a male to make a new life start. Um, and then they say, oh, but it's my body. It's not your body. Um, yeah. Lift up your hand. Is that your hand or your mother's hand? <laughs> you know, when was it ever your mother's hand? You know, it wasn't. It's always been your hand, hasn't it? You know? So when you say it's my body, it's not your body that's, in, that's living inside you. But I don't want it living inside me. Why? You know, that's what it comes down to um, yeah. ultimately, you know. Um, I always but, say the right oh, to my body began when I got my body. <laughs> when you think about it, what does a child receive in the inside when it's growing? Nutrition, hydration, oxygen through the blood. Um, I think I'm not an expert in these medical things, but oxygen, blood circulation. What's different about that um, when it comes outside, when it's born and lives in a much bigger womb, you might say? It gets food that was there all along, air to breathe that was there all along, water to drink, um, all the things that it can now... Now that it's grown and developed from a minuscule size up to up to a bigger size, um, it's the same it's the same reality that it was when it was microscopic in size as to what, until it um, reaches the end of its natural life. It's it's only grown and developed. It's it's being supplied in the womb with the exact same things that it gets outside the womb in order to live. Um, so where do you say that um, you can kill it? Any people who advocate abortion, if you, um, if someone threatened their life, if they were held up by a mugger in the street pointing a gun at their head, um, they wouldn't be saying, oh, yes, it's um, your right to, your body is your right. No, no, um, you can use that to kill me. They wouldn't be saying that, would they? They'd be... Um, 
I'd be running if you take if you take any around. other moral issue, it, you know, you don't hear that. You know? hmm, that's right, because it's um, that's an ideological propaganda. It's directed towards a certain end. Um, yeah. That's what Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II, called the culture of death. Um, but we live a culture of life. You know, because that's what human beings are made for, to live, you know, to, to have a life, to do good, to find good, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, I even the, the atheist Nat Hentoff, are you familiar with him? He was against abortion. He was pro-life. No, I'm not, he, I'm not he, said, uh, he was an atheist who, who believed, you know, this life is all we have, so you can't take mm-hmm. it away from somebody. Well, that's the natural law. He's right. Yeah, He's right. The natural law. You had it for that's, that's exactly right. that's, that's, that's a proposition of the natural moral law, and he's dead right. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't need to know God to figure that out. You yeah. know? But one of the other aspects of the natural moral law is um, we have an inclination to know the truth, the cause and the reason of our being. Oh, does God exist? And what is the ultimate... Um, reason for my existence you know um that's saying that comes from knowing you know right where we are it's a question that we ask ourselves and i think everybody does that you know what's the cause of our existence um uh, what's the reason we are here so So is there any last important and we're running out of time last important lesson that you would um, like people to take away from what yeah, you certainly heard. I would say um, become familiar with uh, what the popes have said. Study um, good Thomas, um, like um, Garagou Lagrange, St. Thomas himself, of course, Garagou Lagrange, Maritain. Maritain can be difficult to read in some of his works, as you probably know. But, um, yeah, and become familiar with the church in this particular area of ethics and morals um, in, because we can't live, because all, all of our actions while we're conscious, while we're awake, are either morally good or morally bad. Um, it's only when we're unconscious or asleep, you know, that we have no awareness of our actions that there's no moral responsibility to attach to them. So um, if we do act... but. Um, yeah, become familiar with what the popes have said about the natural moral law and into discussions with people who don't um, share the faith. Um, you have to treat people, I think, as um, you have to befriend them. You have to be, you have to be charitable towards everybody because everybody's created in the image and likeness of God. No matter how much um, we might think yeah. that that person is a terrible sinner or whatever the case might be or however wicked he might be, there's still a human nature there that's been created in the image and likeness of God. Now, Fideism, Luther would say, no, original sin has completely destroyed that. Human nature is, is rotten to the core. And that's the same impression I get from um, from reading this, you know, this particular. Yeah, that's the impression I get, you know. It's, um, but anyway... So that's, I think, would be um, the final thing I would say on that. I hope I never. <laughs> well, I read most of it. I thought it was wonderful. I thought, you know, it was very, very interesting to read and very important um, to look at this issue because it is the, the, the groundwork that we have for between believers and non believers is the natural law, is mm-hmm. that there's truth and order can be found as a basis before belief. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a basis for culture yeah. mm. and yeah, society. Certainly. And the study of St. Thomas is very, very, very important for, for anyone who's interested in learning truth and um, what reality is, um, how, to think, how to think without uh, being deceived, how the different morals metaphysics, natural philosophy, all these things. It's, I mean, it's a big study, but uh, right, I would especially it recommend it uh, to people who are in graduate school or even coming out of high school and going on to further studies, um, finding these books and reading papal teaching. 
go and yeah. find the teaching of St. Benedict by Benedict the Sixteenth, for example, what he talks about um, ethics and morals on the natural moral law. Go and find out what the church has said about St. Thomas. Look up papal encyclicals. Um, that uh, one beautiful one that they could uh, read um, was the apostolic letter of uh, St. Pope Paul VI that he wrote to the Master General of the Dominicans commemorating the 700th um, anniversary of the birth of St. Thomas in 1974, and that's called Lumen Ecclesia. Now, that's very easy to read. Another good one they could yeah. read, for example, is the one I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Studiorum Ducem, which I took that little prayer from that I opened with, of Pope Pius XI. Uh, another one they can read is Attorney Patris. Uh, another one they can read is Humani Generis of Pope yeah. Pius XII, you know, 1950. All these encyclicals will give a, a person who's desirous, and we have a natural desire to know the truth, a person who's desirous of this, it will give them some sort of a motivation. When they realise what the church is saying about this and how much good can come from reading St Thomas and studying yeah. St Thomas, not only for personal sanctification, holiness and salvation of your soul, but from general benefits in public society. Um, and this is something huge. And this is where the moral law and ethics come in um, because Catholics do have, um, if they only realise that they've been given so much in the gift of faith and faith for fixed reason. So if reason is crooked for a start, then it needs to be straightened out and we need to learn these things that we can know through human reason, that we can know about morals through reason. We need to know these things so that we can actually contribute, we can help people, you know, because there's a lot of people living in darkness in this world. They don't know where they're going or what they're doing. There's a lot of people despairing, especially under these uh, circumstances they've been faced with over the last couple of years, have been shut up inside and um, mm. locked up and all this type of thing. You know, there's a lot of very desperate people out there and they badly need um, people who love them truly, you know, mm. um, for what they are. Human beings created and redeemed by God, you know. So, um, I think a lot, of, a lot of Catholics have no idea that the encyclicals are available. They're available online. Mm. They're there for free. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the encyclicals, the apostolic letters, that most of them are very easy to read. They're accessible. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have to be a, a philosopher, a theologian to understand most of them. Yeah. Um, and they're brilliant. They're wonderful to read. Mm, they are. It's a source. Of, it's an educational source all by itself, you know. Yeah. It really is. Um, yeah. Then you've got encyclicals on the Church's social doctrine as well, and you can get into the documents of Vatican II. Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing about... Shortly after the council, the rumour went around that oh, a lot of people were saying, oh, Vatican II's downgraded devotion to Our Lady. Well, if you look at the dogmatic constitution of the church, there's two dogmatic constitutions in a pastoral council, so we'll, we'll let that, that slip, you know, that, that it's purely pastoral council it was. But there's a beautiful closing chapter on Our Lady in that dogmatic constitution. People really should read that chapter on Our Lady from the dogmatic constitution on the church and the Second Vatican Council. For Catholics who love Our Lady, who should love Our Lady, that, that document is so full of consolation for our modern times um, because we're on a spiritual warfare. Um, a lot of people don't realise this. It's, um, we're being assailed on every side by the powers of darkness and we need the best spiritual weapons that are available to us. And... Um, the mother of God is really our leader in all this. She's the greatest philosopher and thinker that's ever lived. Um, I might try and write a little book about that. Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big task. But anyway, the people need these things, you know. Um, and there's so much. There's people in this world around us who are starving for God. They're starving for goodness. They're starving for love, you know. Um, uh, sin is very empty. It doesn't leave... Um, that brings to ruin, you know. It's, um, it's, um, well, thank so. you for, you know, you've. Con I think you've, this is a great contribution to the church. Um, thank you very much. Very, it's very important. Yeah, very, very important. <laughs> well, um, 
There it is. So if people want to go and buy it, uh, I'm doing a plug for Sebastian here. So um, Great. that's the book. So um, And it's available on Amazon, I assume. That's and correct, yeah. it's also it's also if there's anyone watching this um, from India, it's it's also available, I think, from Potty, P O T H I in India. They can get it there. And I believe bulk orders are also available there as on Amazon. So um, it can be, it's in printed form and also Kindle. People can get it in Kindle format on Amazon and on Poti. So, um, yes, by all means, um, at least buy it to read the paper. Don't take any notice of me. At least buy it to <laughs> read the paper. The paper um, encyclicals quoted from there. And, and the long track that I quoted from St. Thomas on the meta, his metaphysical analysis of the natural moral law and what, um, he said about um, the different types of law, which is beautifully summarised by Father Garagou Lagrange. So, uh, and he's another author I would uh, recommend people to read, Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange. Mm. Uh, the man was uh, a genius and very saintly, very old. He was a genius. There's uh, nothing else that could be said about him. Really. So, mm. uh, you will learn so much from reading his books. So, there you go. Thank you. You want to end us with prayer, please? Certainly, okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And thank you very much, Kiki, and thank God bless you. you with your work. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again before before too much longer. So uh, that would be nice. Thank I've enjoyed you. very much this discussion. So, uh, Me too. Thank you. And, um, yeah, write that book about Mary. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a massive thing. It's a, it's a very sublime subject. So, um, But anyway, if you keep it I'm in I'm a press, convert, I'm, so... Um, yeah. You know, Mary was probably the last thing I came, person I came to as a convert. Oh, um, sure. And I didn't, in my studies at Holy Apostles, I didn't take any Marian courses. Okay. Um, so I'm always looking to, you know, raise mm -hmm. that knowledge. That That's always a little bit deficient. <laughs> so, well, Father Garrett and Lagrange wrote a beautiful book on our lady. Um, what's it called? Um, I got it there somewhere, I can't. The Mother of the Saviour, I think it's called. Um, the Mother of the... Mother of the Saviour. Okay. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Um, so, yeah. I'll write that down. And you could read... Um, there's a couple of uh, papal documents you could read. Um, you could read Lumen Gentium, the chapter that, 8. Yeah. Um, the the uh, encyclical... Um, Munif, 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 Fentissimus Deus, by which Pope Pius XII declared the dogma of Our Lady's Assumption. Okay, and that one I have the, not read. Yeah, 1950, and in Ineffabilis Deus, the, um, the constitution whereby Pope, St. Pope Pius IX declared the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. So, um, okay, I yeah. haven't read the two of those. I've read Lumen Gentian, but not the other two. I will look mm -hmm. for those. Yeah, the encyclicals are amazing. We have a, um, a prayer group that meets here on Thursday nights, and we yes. switch back and forth either between reading scripture or reading mm -hmm. something from tradition and a cyclical. Right now, we're, uh, we're, Still making our way through Fratella Tutti, <laughs> but um, um, but we've read quite a number of the encyclicals and letters, um, and they're mm -hmm. wonderful. Oh yeah, sure. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. in fact, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, I believe, I think he wrote something like eighty encyclicals, or that sort of thing, in his pontificate, long pontificate, um, including about I think maybe I can't remember the exact about eighteen on Our Lady in the Rosary. Um, and he also wrote Attorney Patris, and apparently he was asked, and this is an anecdotal, which is the most important document he, that he'd ever written. He said the very first one, Attorney Patris. He says, because if that, if that is not taken seriously, I've written all the rest in vain. Hmm. So it shows the importance of uh, philosophy. St. Thomas um, and his teaching 
for the life of Catholics and for the life of the world, really. Um, mm. I mean, if you go back, I, I don't remember which pope. It's Pope Leo. It's in the late eighteen hundreds. He wrote Arcanum. Have you read that? Ah, uh, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, that's. I mean, um, it's so prophetic. I mean, you'd think it was written ten years ago, where yeah. he talks about you know the societal things that will happen from divorce, and mm -hmm. it, it's literally you would think he wrote it in nineteen ninety, <laughs> but he wrote it in eighteen ninety. <laughs> Look at Humano Vitae of Pope Paul VI. That's so prophetic. The things that he um, prophesied would happen, they're right on our doorstep now. We're living amongst it now, yeah, you know. Yeah, we're living um, it. Yep. You it's know? amazing. So, yeah. yeah, definitely. The brilliance, mm. uh, the clarity that was there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I guess your day is just starting. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to go get my jammies on. <laughs> I think you deserve a good night's rest after putting up with me for an hour. So <laughs> This is wonderful. And hopefully we'll get a chance to speak again. Yeah, that would be lovely, Kiki. Thank you very much for, for your gracious invitation to join you tonight for this discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed it, and I hope people have actually um, got some ideas uh, for study and for learning good. and for, you know, how to... Um, to go about um, their self-education, because a lot of this you won't find in um, in academic institutions, unfortunately. But right. uh, there you go. So yeah. anyway, good night to you. And All right, God. good night and good, good morning to you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.